you visited the hospital lately, you may well have seen Braddon Parish Commissioner's magnificent new community hub, which has emerged in all its glory. Most followers of Manx politics may also have noticed the rather large 37% increase in Braddon's rates, part of which will be used to cover the costs of the new hub. There's also a rather embarrassing public spat developing between Braddon Commissioners and the Health Department over site access. Perspective this week visits the Roundhouse and tries to add more detail to the alarming headlines. First up, Health Department member Michelle Haywood, MHK. It is fair to say that there's a bit of a spat developed between Braddon Parish Commissioners and your department. Um, yeah, that's yeah, that's probably a fair summary to say that we're, we've got a bit of a, a bit of an impasse at the moment. And what's what's happened? Because because it seems. Uh, if Braddon commissioners are to be believed that th- there was some form of agreement that they could use uh, the access road uh, to the hospital, um, but th- this no longer appears to be the case? There was a letter from the then minister that went to planning to support the, the development when it was there, uh, when it was proposed, and um, that was as far as we can track that there was anything done. However, <laughs> um, when they started speaking to the department about it currently, we spoke with Manx Care and asked them to do a risk assessment on what happens if you put that amount of traffic across what is a very narrow road with no footpaths and no proper lighting on it um, and what impact that would have on the operation of the hospital. And it's quite clear from the work that Manx Care have done in looking at traffic flows that it would actually stop ambulances getting to A&E. So we consider that to be quite a serious risk. The roads on the hospital site are not public roads, they're private roads that belong to the hospital site. Um, And there were always plans drifting around. In fact, we've offered them the land to put in an access road uh, coming off onto the side of the site so that they don't have to interfere with the hospital operation. So an an option is available then. Um, Why would... Braddon Commissioners not want to take that option up, do you think? Um, It probably comes down to money. This project has obviously run over time, over budget. It's not currently open and operating, so they're not getting any income from it. And uh, I think it's clear from their rate rise this year that they're under severe financial pressure. And this is probably just adding to that pressure. Is it possible that some form of compromise, at least short-term solution, can be found to allow the uh, Braddon commissioners to at least begin operation um, provided maybe there's a clear understanding that they do uh, create a, an alternative access point. I think the danger there is there's nothing as long term as a short term fix is there um, and if we've assessed that there's a risk to people not being able to get into access vital services at Nobles Hospital that risk persists whether it's just for a month or a year or whatever it, it all you'll do is start affecting more and more people so i i personally i'd be against finding any short-term fix that does that the, the actual fix is to create a proper access for it and to put in the pedestrian access that was in the plans as well um, and those things are what they need to do to get that building open properly so how i mean it it it, it does uh, there are plenty of uh, public uh, projects um, that uh, you 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 have to scratch your head and wonder how and why. Uh, this does seem to be one of those. Uh, if the, the if the minister was prepared to put in a letter of support, uh, presumably it was the, the previous minister. Um, then then uh, would they not have thought to put in you know, to have undertaken some kind of risk assessment at that point? Well, yeah, obviously when planning goes in, highways are obviously a, a statutory consultee on, on that as well. Um, the car park was planned to be larger than it is. There's not enough spaces there, so we're worried about the impact on Palantine Health Centre um, and their car parking facilities and then people being able to access that health centre. Um, but yeah, it was a former minister that just expressed support, but I don't think it had really been thought through um, what he was supporting and certainly none of the risk assessments have been done. And can you see maybe from Braddon Parish Commissioner's point of view that they would have seen a letter of support from the minister as, um, you know, the green light that, yes, the minister was behind this and the department was behind this? 
Um, I can see why they thought that, but actually they won't have thought that because this has been on the department's radar now for well over a year, probably near a year and a half. So they have known for much longer than the last few weeks, which is where it's obviously hit the media. They've known what the issue is for for quite a while now, that we had um, real concerns over letting them have access through the hospital site. That road is not in good condition anyway. It's obviously not highway, so we can't even throw it at DOI and say improve the condition of this road. It's a private road on the hospital site. I had a tour of the building with long-standing Braddon Commissioner Andrew Jessup, and I must say it's very impressive. Well, we are in what will eventually be a 100-cover uh, cafe, so it will be the usual sort of uh, cafe ambience during the day, and there's an opportunity for the, um, the tenant to actually hold sort of, uh, you know, like, well, run it like a bit of a restaurant in the evenings if they want. Um, then, as you can see, you know, um, well, you can and I can, but obviously we've got this glazed area to, to the front that overlooks uh, a children's play area and then fantastic views towards the south. So, you know, it's a bit of a sun trap. So in the, in the summer, it will be, you know, a glorious place to come and relax and chat and do business or whatever. And we're now in the sports hall. Uh, it's a, yeah, very impressive. Well, we've had an awful lot of compliments from the users that have already made uh, use of the hall, whether they're um, volleyball, um, badminton, obviously there's loads of youngsters coming in to play uh, football. So, yeah, you know, we've been inundated with, with people wanting to make bookings. So, yes, you know, all these people that are saying, why did we build a sports hall when there's the NSC just down the road? Well, they only have to come and see how many people are, uh, are using our facility already. And the, the clubs, presumably, um, that, that are booking here are clubs that couldn't find space at the uh, NSC? Yeah, well, you know, we've heard of um, clubs actually training in farmers' barns because they couldn't get access to other facilities in, in the east. So, yeah, you know, we are not taking, or in competition directly with the NSC, we are, you know, taking some of their overflow um, and also providing for additional sports as we go along. Uh, and where have, where have we got to now? Well, we're next to the uh, soft play area, which uh, um, is going to be for sort of toddler, toddlers um, more than uh, sort of grown-up uh, children. And this area is adjacent to the cafe, so if mum's sort of having a cup of coffee and a chat with her friends, you know, she knows that, uh, you know, in safe viewing distance, her kid could be sort of in there having a good fun and, and uh, play around with a load of other kids in, in, in safe uh, and uh, nurturing environment. And, and then across from here, there's, there's more uh, stuff. I mean, there's, there's just so many bits and pieces to this uh, place, isn't there? Yeah, well, we have the beauticians um, to the right, and then there's going to be uh, therapy rooms. There's the entrance to what will be the pharmacy which obviously, as far as Palatine next door and obviously from a dispensing point, you know, you can not you can get a, a prescription given to you in the hospital, but uh, you have to go to somewhere else to go and get it uh, prescribed. So people can be, literally walk out of the door at the hospital and come, you know, five minutes down the road and they're in to the pharmacy here at the Roundhouse. We did a value engineering exercise before we started work and one of the areas that, that sort of lost out in that exercise was the rotunda and effectively two meters was taken out of the center of the building. So although, you know, you can see that um, we have quite a, a, a nice space in here, um, it was going to be a lot bigger than it is now. <laughs> and, and it's not just here, there were other parts of the building that have reduced in size, are there? Yeah, the whole massing of the building has, has been changed. Um, so, yeah, it, it's a little bit more compact and it's been moved a little bit further away from Harold Cottage, so giving them a little bit more privacy. So, yes, it, it's not as though you know, we just threw money willy-nilly at this. You know, we did seriously think about it throughout the whole process as to how we could actually make sure that this represented best value for money for for the ratepayer but, but still produced a fantastic facility for the future. We all know how difficult it is at times to get a dentist. Yeah, it would be fantastic if the uh, dentist here was both private and av available to uh, NHS patients. Yeah, well, we have the rotunda, which um, we are able to use as our uh, meeting room for 
board meetings if we're expecting a large audience. Um, but it's also available for hire for people to hold their own meetings. We've already had quite a few people uh, booking it for things like Pilates or yoga um, for uh, people. And, uh, you know, there will be a possibility in the future for weddings um, and other sort of small conferences. Then and adjacent to the Rotunda, we have the Baby Century Hub, which has been inundated by people since uh, it's been opened. It's been very popular. Um, and next door to that, there's the gym. And, uh, you know, f we had, a, a le I believe, you know, 300 inquiries just from the hospital alone from people. So, you know, one of the things that we've always said about this place is it's going to provide not only a fantastic facility for the people of Braddon, but for the biggest employer on the Isle of Man, which is, which is the hospital, right on its doorstep. The manager and the owner of the prospective new nursery at the Roundhouse spoke to me about how these delays will affect their business. We're here actually in uh, what is to be the, the, the new nursery, um, but still some work to do to get the whole thing up and running. Yes, unfortunately it is. We expected to be actually open and running from February. Unfortunately now with this delayed road blockage, it could mean up to a year that we're um, able to get up and running, which is really bad for parents. They're desperate to get in. They're at a crisis point where they can't get back to work. Their finances are impacted and also the children's educational journey as well. So it's a real, real blow. The building that we're in here, and certainly the premises that you have, I mean, it's a, a wonderful purpose-built nursery, effectively, isn't it? It is. It's amazing. We're um, so excited to actually um, get in here and to be up and running. It's a, a wonderful nursery for the children. It's all on one level. It's got lovely outdoor garden, beautiful, big, spacious rooms. And, and yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's absolutely lovely. It's more than we could have asked for. And trying to understand a bit more about it uh, for people who maybe driven past and, and saw the, the roundhouse bit from which it, the, the, the building gets its name. It's, it's an enormous building, isn't it? And there's, there's an awful lot more than, than just this nursery uh, in, in that building. Yes, there's a lot. There's lots of other businesses, and they're not just new businesses. They're extensions of previous businesses. So you've got the Baby Sensory Hub, you've got the Sports Hall. The Sports Hall is actually offered sports teams from the NSC that couldn't get a regular slot, a permanent position. So it's actually really beneficial for the community and that may have to come to a stop. It, it's hard really to understand, uh, and certainly having already spoken, we heard from health member Michelle Haywood, um, it's hard to understand how we could have got to this uh, this point. Yes, it is. Um, it is. It's a shock for us all. But I do feel that there isn't enough clarity around how we actually got to this point. So in the media, it seems to be all um, spun towards Braddon commissioners. But really, when you look back at the planning in 2016, there was the Brown Hall report and there was also um, a letter from um, the Howard Quayle, um, all fully supportive of the this Build. So when you look at that, you do ask yourself, the planning application was based on this support. Why is it now being withdrawn? Um, I think what a lot of people don't realise is that it's all down to this access road. Why didn't Braddon Commissioners build the road? But we can't build something that we don't own. So the land that is being given to them hasn't actually been transferred yet. So why hasn't it been transferred can't build something if you don't have anything to begin with. Indeed, indeed. And, and in terms of the impact, I mean, presumably it's not just your business. There must be lots of businesses that are going to be impacted uh, by this. But uh, from, from your own business, I mean, not opening in February, um, you still have costs that you have to meet and places uh, that you are unable to, to, su you to supply for, for parents who are looking to... to, um, to to get their children into a nursery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. We've really kitted this place out. We see it as a nursery of the future. We have added so many extra design elements into it to make sure that it's a really lovely educational space for the children, but also for the staff to work here. We've t we're very experienced in this area. We know what nurseries need to run smoothly. And so we've gone to a lot of additional cost to make it the nursery that it should be. 
And unfortunately, if it doesn't get up and running soon, it is going to have a, a terrible impact. That was the owner and the manager of the new nursery at the Roundhouse. There'll be a lot more from Braddon Commissioner's Chair Andrew Jessop after the break when we explore the politics of the development in much more detail. You're listening to Perspective and we're talking to Braddon Commissioner's Chair Andrew Jessop. So I was always uh, well aware of the fact that the land at the Strand Cornerfield had been promised to the commissioners um, for the purposes of community facilities. So as... In fact, part of my um, manifesto in 2004 was um, that we ought to use the land that we'd been uh, offered um, to provide the community facility that it was being provided for. So um, we then went to um, draw up a scheme in 2005. Um, We got to the petition stage. The proposal was something along similar lines to what we've got here today. But um, even from that day, um, it was known that the only way to access this site was using hospital roads. And uh, an agreement in principle was arrived at at that time that that's the way that we would get into the site. Agreement in principle uh, back in, when When are you saying now? Um back in 2005. Okay, so move on 19 years. Um, How has an agreement in principle not moved any further than that? Well, we um, obviously made a planning application for the the development that's that's proceeded in, in 2016. And as part of the planning application, the then Minister for Health, um, Howard Quayle, wrote a letter to the planners to say that they fully supported um, the commissioner's proposal uh, without reservation and that access to the site would be through the hospital grounds. Therefore, obviously, we relied on that um, for the purposes of, of, of designing and, and moving ahead with the, with the project. If we hadn't had you know, access to the site or that agreement, then obviously we wouldn't have uh, started building. And uh, obviously we're talking about large sums of public money and there's no way that uh, anybody would have committed themselves to such a project if they didn't feel as though they had um, the necessary approvals for access to the site. We'll come back to that, but let's stick to the ambition because this is a, a, a very ambitious project, isn't it? It is, but um, when you consider that we have a current government who wishes to expand the population and also retain the people that we've already got, uh, then this is the type of facility that you know the island plan is is calling for. Um, certainly, you know, in all the the discussions that we've had as commissioners about um, what type of facility we wanted. Not only was it supposed to be, you know, for all the people of Braddon and, you know, sort of multi-generational, you know, we always wanted everybody from effectively cradle to grave to be able to find something that they could actually make use of here. It was always, you know, the back of our mind that, again, you know, this site is right next door to one of the most critical bits of infrastructure in the whole of the Isle of Man, which is our hospital. And we're always you know talking about wanting to have you know the best possible medical care for the people in the Isle of Man and that means you have the best possible people and in order to try and attract those people and also to retain those people you know they need to have some reason other than their job to come to the Isle of Man Um, and therefore you know having this facility and and we've been told this by quite a number of people from from uh the, uh, from Manx Care, uh, you know, and working within the hospital environment, you know, this is one of the things that has been, you know, most, you know, anticipated by them for the last two, three, four years. You know, they're, they're really excited about the fact that they're going to have this fantastic facility on their doorstep with all the, the varied different types of uh, facility. Um, you know, and we've got the housing for the doctors and nurses next door. So they've got a literally, you know, two minute walk to a facility that, that, that we've provided. So yes, it, it, it was ambitious, 
but we never felt it was over ambitious. And you know, there are some people you know saying that we built a white elephant, and why have we spent all this money? You know, um, well, we had to obviously put a business case together. You know, it wasn't just a case of convincing ourselves this was a was a good idea and a good project, and it and it made sense financially. Was we also had to persuade the Department, you know, of Infrastructure and the Treasury, you know. So we've we've had to do that on more than one occasion, and they've obviously felt themselves that we've made a good enough case to actually warrant them supporting the project as we've gone along. And indeed, I remember as Infrastructure Minister back in 2016, uh, quizzing the commissioners over this and asking quite some, well, I would hope anyway, searching questions about why the commissioners felt this was necessary and uh, uh, how it was all going to work. So uh, that that is a, perhaps a part of uh, local government that um, many listeners wouldn't really understand. But the, the, the process for a local authority to borrow money is quite an elaborate one and requires a, a lot of central government scrutiny. Yeah, you know, it's a robust and rigorous um, system, as you say, of scrutiny. So, you know, it wasn't as though the the figures etc were done on the best back of a fact packet you know we, we had to put you know a lot of time and effort into coming up with how much it was going to cost how much we felt that we could generate in terms of income and we were you know in our in our mind we were very conservative in what we thought that we could actually raise in income but at the same time you know we never wanted this to be a a burden on on the ratepayer yes you know um, there will be a contribution to the cost of running it. However, you know, it was never our intention to to actually, you know, make this a what has turned out in the last year to be, you know, rather a contentious subject in terms of our rate setting for the next uh, year or so. You certainly hit the headlines when it comes to rate setting, haven't you? Yeah, we we have, but um, what might interest people, that those people that are complaining that we've increased our rates by the best part of 37%, in a meeting recently with the Minister for Treasury, Health and Infrastructure, we were actually told that we should have doubled our rates for next year. So, you know, we feel that... Uh, Thirty-seven percent. You know that that was uh, more than sufficient for what we felt at the time was needed. But again, it, it was one hell of a shock to us to be told that uh, we should have known that uh, we were going to be in it, potentially in a position where we would have no income because of the um, situation over the ad- access, and we should have passed that um, um, cost on to to to, ne- to the ratepayers next year. But uh, you know. I find that difficult to justify. So, so effectively, because uh, I had perhaps maybe uh, unwisely that it, it appears uh, assumed that the thirty-seven uh, percent increase in rates uh, was as a result of this little uh, spat with uh, government, uh, and you recognising that you weren't going to get quite as much income as you originally anticipated. But this is this isn't. The, the the lost income that's likely to result if if an agreement can't be reached reached that hasn't been part of the budget uh, setting for, for the, uh, rate setting for this year. We've made um, some provision, but uh, we obviously felt that the negotiations we were having with Manx Care, as opposed to the, with the department, were proceeding well, and that uh, we would get to a position whereby we would satisfy any uh, concerns from Manx Care in terms of uh, um, access and, and egress from the site without causing any undue uh, problems for the emergency, you know, sort of the ambulance service. Uh, and we've done that by obviously coming through West Drive off Ballarat Road rather than from the main entrance so we don't cross the route of, of the ambulance that was one thing and we've also been working closely with um you know hospital estates to address some of the concerns about uh, 
pedestrian uh, access um, and vehicle access to the site. So, yeah, we thought that we were moving towards, you know, a, um, a satisfactory, satisfactory resolution of these problems and that the um, objections to using the roadway would, would be removed and we would be, as I say, fully operational by Easter. At the moment, we're still in that, that bit of limbo because we obviously currently still have that threat of um, our access being blocked by some means, rather, from the 4th of March. And as we've already seen from the, the tour of the building, uh, you already have tenants uh, operating in the building um, and you have p prospective tenants keen to, to operate. And, and perhaps I shouldn't have said tenant uh, because uh, you can't give tenancy agreements at the moment. Uh, you're giving uh, licences, I think. Yeah, that's been the, the way for those that felt that they could operate without um, having uh, vehicle access was to, to offer them in the interim um, a license to operate. Um, however, yes, there are issues with uh, two of the main uh, potential tenants in that they also, that, well, what, you know, one in particular needs the tenancy arrangement in order to get registration for their business. And that obviously um, is at the moment, you know, a difficult situation for them to be in. Um, and yeah, obviously we feel as though <laughs> we're doing everything that we can to um, improve the situation so that we can offer them the, the tenancies. You know, we, we have, in our opinion, we, you know, we, we're the ones that have bent over backwards. We've agreed to, to expend ratepayers' money on uh, addressing infrastructure concerns uh, regarding the hospital. And, and it's worth uh, noting that in, back in 2016, um, a uh, traffic assessment and parking assessment was um, commissioned by, um, I bl believe it was Manx Care, to look into the problems on, on the um, hospital site in terms of, as I say, trans tra transport and uh, um, parking. And a number of recommendations were made in that report. And eight years later, most if not all of those, to my knowledge, have not been implemented. So that would have been, at that time, the Department of Health um, rather than Manx Care, because that's obviously only come into being uh, fairly recently. Uh, so, yeah, so that's eight years of, of inaction on the department's part. Perhaps then that explains why, back in 2016, the minister felt, I mean, you know, I, I suppose we're speculating here, but maybe this is why the minister felt that they could, they could support this, uh, this project. Well, that, that may have been so. Uh, certainly... Minister Quayle you know, pointed to the fact that, that it was well known that there were parking issues on uh, the hospital site. You know, so to be honest, it would be crazy to block an entrance to our site and the 70 car parking spaces, um, you know, because those people are likely to still uh, drive on the hospital roads and then try and find a parking space in other car parks within the hospital. Um, so, yeah, that, that would be, uh, in our view, you know, adding to the risks rather than diminishing the risks. Uh, Michelle Hayward, when I interviewed her, and we, obviously we listened to her at the start of the programme, um, said that the number of parking spaces that were in an initial um, version of this uh, project had been reduced. Is, is that the case? I think we're talking about four or five parking spaces and since the uh, um, revised uh, planning application went in I think we've gained one of those back um, but you've got to bear in mind that during the planning stage it was agreed that the largest volume of users would be coming to the site in potentially in the evening and at weekends when the uh, large proportion of, of the hospital um, uh, clinics, etc., 
wouldn't be um, operating. And therefore, you know, we've already had, you know, an agreement to use the spaces in the Palatine uh, in the evening. There was also mention in the um, statement of case that supported the planning application for the new um, roadway that um, we would have access to next door as well which has got another 73 parking spaces which was more than uh, the estimated amount for the maximum you know usage of our site so you know yes there, there are during daytime um, you know there will be pressure on parking spaces but uh, to say that that alone is a reason for objecting to us using their roadways is, is I think, um, slightly spurious. In terms then of, of I mean, you are famously a, a, a green politician, um, a big supporter of the, the Green Centre and uh, various other uh, such things. Um, presumably, the, some thought has been uh, put into use of public transport to access this site. Well, we effectively have buses running past the site, um, you know, on a half hourly basis. Um, and therefore, yeah, the hope was that, uh, you know, c quite a number of people would use the bus service to get here. Obviously, um, there is an active travel um, policy that, that's supposedly being promoted by DOI and government to actually try and encourage more people to cycle or walk to places. But obviously we recognise that this facility will be used by people that are coming from slightly further afield and therefore, you know, the bus service might not be convenient for them um, and they're not about to try and uh, walk from Port Erin. So, um, yes, there will be a certain number of people that come here by car. OK, so we've, we've had... Um, uh, the tour. We've heard from one of the tenants. We've heard the department's position, um, and we've heard, I think, the the commissioner's uh, position. Um, many people around the island will be thinking, for goodness sakes, this you know, there must be a way in which politicians can sit down together and um, come up with a, a pragmatic solution that works for everybody. Well. I feel that the commissioners have done everything in their power to try and um, sit down and find a pragmatic solution that satisfies everybody's uh, requirements. You know, the, the, the thing to remember is that, that we've never said no to, to building um, the new access. What we've actually uh, said is at this time we, can't, we couldn't afford it because you know, the money just wasn't there. You know, it's something that we hadn't budgeted, budgeted for in the initial um, build project. Uh, we had various prices given to us during the phase where, you know, we were um, obtaining planning permission for it. But those prices, like everything else, kept going up and up and up. So you then start to question whether it's, um, you know, value for money or, or whether when we're told that we ought to be prioritising um, expenditure, when there was already what we felt was a perfectly uh, good and acceptable access to our site, why would we then uh, have to find another quarter of a million pounds potentially to put in uh, a new access road? So, you know, not unlike you know, the fact that the Department of Health stroke Manx Care may have not done info instruct infrastructure improvements around the hospital on the basis they didn't have the money then why is it any different from us ourselves saying at the time not only do we not have the land on which to build it on you know we do not have the money in in the in the our um funds to actually um progress the scheme and we asked for support at the time we asked for you know, what we thought, felt, you know, in the grand scheme of things was a fairly minuscule amount of £60,000 from the department to contribute towards um, the scheme. And uh, to be honest, it was at one stage that it was a member of uh, uh, Manx Care that had said because it was uh, for our mutual uh, benefit uh, to have the new roadway, it was them that suggested perhaps it ought to be a jointly funded scheme. So it was only later, you know, after we'd, 
said on that basis, yes, we we proceed. That you know we were told um, in August that um, the only contribution that the department would make would be the uh, tr the transfer of the land, um, and that there would be no money whatsoever towards the actual cost of putting in the roadway. Therefore, faced with that um, situation whereby we still didn't have control of the land, um, we didn't have any offer of, uh, of uh, help towards the, the financing for, for it. Plus, we were told there was going to be another three months delay in uh, completion of the project, and that obviously had a potential implications for the income that we were going to receive then in that situation I can't believe that anybody else would have not made the same decision as us that we couldn't afford to, to continue with that uh, new roadway at that time. But at some point, uh, presumably the commissioners would be content, assuming that the department was, was willing to transfer the land to, uh, to, to solve this, this uh, problem. Um, well... We have we have said that you know if they uh, um, will move forward and, and uh, transfer the land, you know it's it's annoying that you know when they were being asked back in the summer last year to come up with the agreement to 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 convey the land, um, nothing happened. Um, you know had that been progressed then, um, and we had been told uh, formally that um, without the new uh, road access, access otherwise would be denied, then that might have changed the situation and we might not be in the situation we are now. But the reality is, you know, back in August, we were, uh, we were getting nowhere forward in terms of getting access to the site and um, we were also not getting an answer in terms of, you know, whether or not we would have um, any problem accessing the site from what was the originally approved um, entrance. You know, the question was put, and when it was put to the minister, why didn't he tell us? He said, well, I didn't have to. OK, that's a, an interesting answer. Uh, so, so you met with Minister for Treasury, Minister for Health, and Minister for Infrastructure. Um, did you get encouragement from that meeting that perhaps a solution to this at least a short-term solution to this can be found whilst the the the, the preferred longer-term solution or perhaps medium term would be a better word is is uh, developed no uh, to the contrary actually um we got to a point in the meeting whereby even though we said that we felt that we were getting to a point where uh, representatives of Manx Care felt that the risks that they had identified could be mitigated. Uh, he said that um, even if Manx Care uh, stopped objecting, he would on the basis of no other reason than the Commissioner's attitude. Okay, that, that's, that's a, an interest. So he, the he you're referring to there is the Health Minister? Yeah, Mr Hooper, yes. Okay, um, well, that's an interesting approach. Um, let's let's try and understand some of the numbers here because a, a thirty-seven percent increase in rates sounds like a huge amount. Uh, presumably, that means that there must have been perhaps an overspend in the budget. Um, well, can you what can you tell us in terms of the figures for all this? Uh, how much was it? Uh, predicted to cost how much did it eventually cost what's the likely or, or the estimated income that the uh, commissioners are expecting from the businesses uh, uh, how, how does all that work well the uh, project has, has gone up from around about the six and a half million but because of delays we've got to obviously factor in inflation in because it wasn't a fixed price contract as such you know that the, the uh, contractor is allowed to uh, ask for additional uh, money to take into account, you know, price of materials, etc., have gone up. Um, so that has accounted for a large proportion of the increase in expenditure. Like any scheme, as you go along, you sometimes find that what you originally planned doesn't work quite out, quite out the way you intend when you actually get on the ground. So there have had to be some design 
changes uh, to it to accommodate uh, some improvements to the security of the roof, which probably was a good idea given the storms that we've had recently, and that's been well tested and didn't blow away. Um, the commissioners themselves decided that uh, there was a few things that we'd actually taken out during the value engineering stage that probably um, on reflection would have been better to have kept in, such as the uh, seating um, area, the pull-out seating that is, and also we added the, um, the solar panels on the roof, but that only accounts to, to a small percentage of the increase in the overall spend on the project. Um, there have been obviously tenant, you know, prospective tenants that have said, yeah, we'd like to um, uh, hire the space. However, we want some changes done to the original plans. They will obviously be paying for that um, through an increase in their um, uh, rental rates. So again, you know, that may, you know, it might look like a lot of money, um, but as I say, that will be recouped through through income from from the tenants. Um, but as you will know well yourself from being minister for uh, infrastructure, the way that we operate capital projects over here, you know, there are certain rules that the commissioners have to work to. And when it comes to things like fees, etc., you know, we're rather stuck in a situation whereby we, if the project goes on for longer, you end up paying more. You know. Uh, and Which actually seems to most people as quite perverse because you would hope that the incentive should be to uh, to get the project delivered on time. You would, you would think that, but obviously under the scheme that we have, if the contractor can come up with a justifiable reason for why the project has been lay, delayed, then the project uh, length gets extended and you know it keeps moving further and further into the distance so this idea of people saying why aren't you charging people penalties well the penalties only come in when they exceed you know um the period at which the the project team has said is no longer reasonable but you know so far you know all their their compensation events have been approved by the project uh, um manager and therefore yeah we obviously have to pay on the basis of they were justifiable increases in cost. So the 37% increase then, we've got, only got a few minutes left now. Um, how does, how, what, what are the ratepayers of Braden, Braden paying for uh, in relation to that? It won't be all this, this uh, building, will it? No, because obviously, like every other authority that have had, you know, quite a lot of them have had to increase their costs quite dramatically. Um, you know, there are costs in terms of, you know, uh, salary increases because of pay, pay rises. Then there's obviously increased charges, as everybody knows, from the um, disposal charge for the incinerator. Um, and, you know, just general inflationary costs. Wherever possible, we've, we've tried to trim back on uh, a few areas. Um, we've had to put the DOI actually on notice that we may not be do, uh, carrying, conducting any more of the transferred services um, next year because we just won't have the money. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, obviously we, we had to make provision for the fact that you know, we've lost a certain amount of income that we were anticipating. In fact, every day uh, delay in uh, not being able to get the tenants uh, tenancies signed is costing us a thousand pounds a day so so in terms then let, 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 roughly uh, what percentage of that increase uh, is it a third is it two thirds is it half um, what what proportion of the increase uh, is down to this project the, uh, the there's probably be a, about a third of the uh, the money that we're asking for this next financial year is down to the additional costs that we've incurred. Um, yet we, we'd worked out it was about, um, well, we, we'd always um, envisaged that there was going to be about 45 pence on the rates to run um, the, uh, or subsidise the, the, the building. But at the moment, yeah, we're probably running at about a pound. Um, but as I say, as you've said as well, you would have thought that um, grown-ups should be able to sit down and come to a solution. And, and at our meeting this afternoon, we did hope that um, if the um, 
department can progress with an agreement to transfer the land and we make a commitment to progressing with building the new roadway, they will actually withdraw their threat to actually block our access in the meantime. And, of course, uh, what Michelle Haywood said as a short-term uh, fix has a habit of becoming a long-term fix, but only if the uh, department is, isn't wise in the way it makes its offer. So if the department says, OK, you have two years of this, after the two years you have to have uh, built the alternative access, um, at least you know then where you stand. Well, well, that's true. So, you know, it, it's in nobody's interest as far as we're concerned, um, particularly it's not in the interest even of, of uh, Manx Care and the department because any additional costs that we incur because of the delays in getting the tenancies signed will go on the rates and the biggest rate payer in Braddon is the hospital. hospital you know? So, you know, it's... To us, it is absolutely ludicrous, and that was one of the reasons why I asked for a meeting with the Treasury Minister, was that it was potentially we could have avoided a lot of the pain for the ordinary ratepayer in Braddon if the department had actually, if they couldn't find the money, have asked uh, Treasury to find a small amount of money to help fund the roadway back in the summer last year. So subsequent to that interview, Andrew uh, got in touch and uh, Andrew you, you're joining me now in in the studio um, what, what what new piece of evidence have you uncovered well we've been searching for the needle in the haystack ever since uh, Mr Hooper dropped the bombshell on us that he was no longer going to allow us permission to use the hospital roads and he kept insisting that it was up to us to prove that we had an agreement um, to use the hospital roads um, and effectively he wanted that agreement in writing. Well, obviously it took some time, you know, like searching for a needle in a haystack and unfortunately been looking for the needle in the wrong part of the haystack. Anyway, purely by chance yesterday I put a different name into the search uh, engine of my uh, emails and up popped this email that um, came from uh, the minister, then minister in, in March 2016 in response to an email I'd said which in it I'd sort of uh, obviously was being a bit of a um, soothsayer in the fact that I'd said to him you know whilst there may be some form of gentleman's agreement in place I would far rather have it in writing so there could be no arguments in the future well if only uh, <laughs> That had been the case. And, and then Howard, uh, Howard Quayle responded quite positively. He certainly did. And he said, thank you for your email regarding access rights for Braddon Parish Commissioners to the Strand Cornerfield through the grounds of Nobles Hospital and associated buildings. Whilst access has always been granted by the department to allow the field to be used by the commissioners for social events, I can well understand your need to have a formal agreement. A, a conveyance of land will be required in order to regularise boundaries following our respective proposed developments. Within that deed, we propose to incorporate the appropriate wording which will grant the right of way which the commissioners require. I trust that this proposal is acceptable, but in the meantime, please accept this letter as authority to access the field when you require to do so. Gosh. So, so that really kind of, well, it, of course, what, what we know is that ministers come and go and mm. ministers' authority and, and views change and that's obviously what's now happened. Um, but you could quite understand why uh, Braddon Parish Commissioners would take the view that they had permissions from the department to, to access the site f via the, the hospital roads. Well, to us, a promise is a promise, you know, and... For the last eight years we have been reminding the department that the conveyances that are discussed and the agreement discussed in in this e email exchange are still outstanding so what do you think is this a white elephant or bold ambition for the people of braddon naive mismanagement from the commissioners or stubborn intransigence from the health minister 
Let me know your thoughts on the programme by contacting philgorn at manxradio.com and get in touch if you have any ideas for future shows. Don't forget this programme is available as a podcast. For now, I'm Phil Gorn, got a Myers and Geistergrom. Thanks for listening. <laughs>